Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for an MP webinar outlining government contract opportunities for small businesses. I'm Amy Newman, the head of marketing here at MP, and we are very excited to have three guest presenters here today from the Small Business Association or Administration. Those of you joining us on a webinar for the first time, NP is a full service human capital management company offering a suite of products and services, including HR, payroll, benefits administration, time and attendance, recruiting and compliance assistance. We support our clients with cutting edge technical solutions as well as proactive and reliable service and deep HR and payroll expertise. At NP, we are wired for HR and help our clients succeed by aligning their HR strategy with their business goals. The U.S. Small Business Administration works to ignite change and spark action so small businesses can confidently start, grow, expand, or recover. Created in 1953, the SBA continues to help small business owners and entrepreneurs pursue the American dream. The SBA is the only cabinet-level federal agency fully dedicated to small businesses and provides counseling, capital, and contracting expertise as the nation's only go-to resource and voice for small businesses. I'm thrilled to introduce your presenters today, uh, Peter Kantakos, Diane Darling, and Caroline Williams. Peter serves as the Massachusetts Deputy Director within the, small, within the U.S. Small Business Administration. He is responsible for outreach and marketing activities to, to promote opportunities for accessing capital, counseling, and contracting. Diane Darling is a marketing and outreach specialist with the Massachusetts Small Business Administration. She focuses on education and outreach to get the word out on how the SBA services can help small businesses succeed. And lastly, Caroline Williams is an outreach and marketing specialist with the Massachusetts District Office of the SBA. She helps businesses and resource partners learn more about SBA programs and services through various pre presentations and community outreach. She's also worked on the Restaurant Revi Revitalization Fund and the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant to help small businesses find much needed pandemic relief. And before I turn the program over to Peter, I just wanna remind everyone that this program is for educational purposes only and should not be construed as specific legal advice. And also, if you would like to submit a question during the webinar, Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen and your questions will be answered at the end of the program. And then lastly, a recording of the webinar will be sent out later today along with the presentation deck. And with that, I will turn the mic over to Peter. Thanks very much, Amy. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. If at any point, for whatever reason, you can't hear me well, please just let me know. Um, Amy, thanks so much for inviting us back to um, do another webinar uh, with your group. Um, we joined you a couple months ago for the first time and did a uh, SBA uh, overview webinar about our various uh, uh, programs and services. And uh, we're thrilled to be back today and um, you know, going uh, a little more in depth, uh, doing a deeper dive on the government contracting uh, uh, programs that SBA can offer. Um, so today's agenda, as is presented here on the slide, we're just going to briefly go over our mission and strategic planning objectives here at SBA. Um, we're going to really dive deep into government contracting, and I say dive deep, but we could definitely go a lot deeper. So I'm going to try and not overwhelm folks with information, but just really provide information um, so folks can, can learn about government contracting. Um, get an idea of the programs and services that are available through SBA and across the federal government, um, and uh, and you know just point folks in the right direction in terms of, of resources and um, uh, websites and, and how to do some independent research. Uh, we'll briefly touch on some technical assistance that SBA offers through our resource partner network, um, and we'll briefly go over a, a very popular uh, loan program that SBA currently has ongoing until the end of the calendar year. And then we'll have time for some questions and, uh, and answers. Great, thank you. So our mission here at SBA, just real quick. Um, so we've been supporting small businesses for over 68 years as, as the slide says here. And, and the bottom line is we're here to help companies with, with their planning, 
um, of a business, uh, you know, a business plan before you actually go into business, launching the actual business, um, managing that business, and then growing that business. Our strategic planning obje objectives um, for the period of 2018 to 2022 are outlined here. Uh, again, at the end of the day, it's really doing whatever it is that um, you know is needed for the small business communities at the local, state, and, and national levels. Um, really, you know, focusing on entrepreneurship and healthy um, uh, business-friendly ecosystems. The four main areas that SBA supports. Um, our uh, free business counseling, that's the technical assistance piece that we'll talk about um, later on in the presentation. Um, SBA does provide uh, uh, guarantees for loans, so you can work with your respective lending institutions to obtain SBA loans. Uh, the lenders work with us because we guarantee um, either some or all of that loan. Um, and then also, uh, Disaster loans. Um, we provide a lot of disaster relief, um, typically for you know hurricanes and tornadoes and and those types of events. But we've been providing a lot of disaster relief for um, the pandemic this past year and a half. And then federal government contracting, and that's the the part we're really going to focus on uh, today. So, are you ready to consider federal contracting? So. Um, the federal government is the world's largest uh, a buyer of a variety of products and services. Um, and also the federal government is required by law to provide contracting opportunities to small businesses. So just a, a really brief um, uh, background on that. So um, during the second world war um, and afterwards, it was determined that we needed a very strong and robust um, industrial base. and small businesses were able to provide a lot of niche products, a lot of um, uh, capability uh, that um, other companies just weren't able to provide. And so um, that really helped with the war effort. And then following the Second World War, it was determined that um, we really needed to, to have a focus on trying to support small businesses, to elevate them, to um, you know, provide them whatever resources are needed to be able to be successful, um, both in the marketplace, but also to um, help support um, uh, with the war effort, an ongoing, you know, war effort. So we ended up, you know, transitioning from World War II to the Cold War. And, and, and then, you know, afterwards in, in the 60s and 70s, there was a, a, a transition too in terms of thinking about how we promote and support small businesses. And um, it was more of a discussion about equity and inclusion. And so we're hearing a lot of that um, today as well. So, um, you know, we'll talk about various socioeconomic programs, um, set aside programs that are out there. So, you know, again, just wanted to, uh, to give a sense of, you know, how the Small Business Administration, you know, got started and um, and kind of how we've evolved, you know, in the 68 years uh, since the inception. Um, so uh, as it's uh, listed here at the bottom, you know, sba.gov slash contracting provides a, a very general overview on government contracting. And then you can also dive deeper too. I've got a slide with um, uh, all the resource links towards the end. Um, and as we go through the presentation, you know, I'll, I'll highlight some things. And again, I'll just, you know, reference or mention that we have those links at the very end of the presentation. I didn't want to put links everywhere on these slides. So, um, but everything is at the, at the very end of the presentation. So with regards to federal government contracting, um, there are uh, goals that the government has to meet every year. Uh, and so, um, we have what we call prime contracts and subcontracts. So prime contracts are direct awards to small businesses. Um, they can be direct awards to other than small businesses as well. Um, you know, sometimes we refer to them as large businesses, but the technical term is other than small businesses. Um, the the government wide goal um, across the entire enterprise each year is 23% of prime contracting dollars going to small businesses. Um, now within that definition of small business, there are set aside categories, and these are those socioeconomic programs I had referenced earlier. 
So the four set aside programs are the 8A business development program. Um, that's also referred to as the small disadvantaged business uh, program. So within that specific program, um, to be qualified as an 8A firm, um, 8A comes from section 8A of the uh, Small Business Act. Um, you have to be considered socially, economically disadvantaged. Um, and the individual who is considered both socially and economically disadvantaged has to have at least 51% ownership and control of the business. So um, as I'll talk about in a, a little bit, these definitions in terms of who qualifies, whether or not you're eligible, they're all laid out in the Code of Federal Regulations, otherwise referred to as the CFR. And you know, typically, folks who are uh, uh, who qualify for the 8A program are folks who, at some point or another, have been um, determined uh, by Congress to have been um, at a disadvantage, um, to have been discriminated against as a as a class. Um, and so, you know, some examples are African Americans, Asian Americans. You know, there are more. Um, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds because there's a lot to it. And, and if you do apply for the program, it's a, 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 a vetting process that could take anywhere from six months to a couple of years. Um, the reason being is if you, you know, are considered for one of these set asides, you do get um, preference for being able to bid and propose on government contracts. So so I just want to make you guys aware that's one of the set asides that exist. Um, another one is the historically underutilized business zone program. It's also referred to as hub zone. So the hub zone program um, actually originated in Europe, and then um, the U.S. followed that model in 1997. And what that program aims to do is it aims to um, uh, identify parts of the country um, you know, different states, different cities and towns and counties within states that have been determined to be historically underutilized. And so it's really a, an economic uh, development and, um, and, and growth uh, program. And so the, um, to be in a hub zone, there is a, a map. Um, if you go online and you just Google the hub zone map, you'll be able to see if your uh, uh, principal uh, place of business is located in a hub zone. 35% um, uh, minimum of the employees that the business has would have to also themselves reside in a hub zone, um, as well as the business being located in a hub zone. And then there's gonna be that 51% um, uh, ownership and control of the individual who runs the, the hub zone business. Um, the next category is woman-owned small business. So um, it sounds pretty straightforward. Not everything with the federal government or especially contracting is very straightforward. But, but again, here you need 51% or more um, ownership and control um, uh, by a woman. Um, and, and there's a net worth uh, standard as well. Um, I believe it's 750,000 or less. Um, and, and so this one's a little unique in that um, there's some more caveats as to whether or not um, uh, you would qualify for a set aside. For, for this one specifically, there has been a determination made about what types of work, what types of um, industries and sectors women have been um, disadvantaged and or discriminated against. And so we're going to talk about how those industries and sectors are um, developed in a couple slides. They're referred to as the NAICS firms, North American Industry Classification System. So the last one here is service disabled veteran owned. This is again straightforward in terms of you know you have to be a veteran and you have to you know have been service disabled and, and the CFR lays out the definition of a service disabled veteran owned small business. So so within the small business um, uh, umbrella. These are the set asides. If you don't fall into any of these four, you can still get contracts. You just won't get one of these set asides, which are given preference before the government um, will uh, solicit a requirement um, for any small business. 
So let's say, you know, prime contracting is not what you want to do. You don't want a direct contract with the government or for whatever reason you can't get it. There's also um, subcontracting, uh, excuse me, subcontracting opportunity. So, so if a prime contractor, you know, needs some niche support, has a hole on the team and they need an expert or they need another company to really um, uh, provide them uh, a, a part of the solution to meet the government's requirement, they can subcontract with a, with a company. And so if you're new to this um, arena and you're not quite sure you really want to take the risk of, of being a prime contractor, you can consider being a subcontractor you know, to an established prime. And so it's going to be really important to know who you're working with, what type of relationship you're entering into, what type of agreement you guys have for work sharing and you know, things of that nature. So um, that's going to come up later in the presentation as well, but just something to really um, you know, consider because you don't want to not do your due diligence and then get stuck with a prime contractor that you're not happy with and will also harm your reputation um, in the government contracting uh, world. Um, beyond contracts, right? So we're talking about contracts. Um, there are micro purchases. Those are under $10,000. Um, and so what those are, um, are uh, purchases the government makes with a government purchase card. You know, folks refer to it as a credit card. It's not really a credit card because there's no interest charged, but it's just a simple card that makes purchases. It's very um, easy to do. It's an effective tool. Of course, there are rules and regulations that govern how the government can make those purchases. But, you know, if the government identifies you as a company that can satisfy their requirement or their need, it's got the capability, they feel confident you can do the work, they can go to you directly and they don't need to um, go through any other hoops, basically. Now, some agencies will say, you know what, it's a best practice to at least review, you know, two or three different companies. Um, we prefer to, you know, uh, partner with small businesses, but there really is a lot of uh, power on the government contracting uh, agency side with these micro purchases. So that's a great way to potentially, like, you know, get put um, in the door and something to think about. Um, we then move on to simplified acquisitions. So those are valued under $250,000. They are not formal contracts. They're considered purchase orders. They work very similarly to contracts, but um, the terms and conditions are a bit different and there's not as much risk um, undertaken with those simplified acquisitions. But those are also a, a really good way to, again, Get your foot in the door if you're looking to start out um, working with with federal agencies, and with the simplified acquisitions, the the law requires that they um, uh, that the government considers small businesses first. They can be any type of small business. They don't have to consider these set aside requirements. When you go on to contracts which are value, valued at greater than two hundred fifty thousand dollars or more, that's where as a program office official, right? If you're an engineer or a technical expert and you have a need and you and you got to buy something, you know, if it's, you know, you're working for the Department of Defense and it's to help the warfighter or you're working for a civilian agency and you need, um, you know, an IT contract to provide, you know, information technology services or communications uh, support, you need to do market research and you need to look at the um, small business set aside uh, programs, so socioeconomic programs, we just discussed those four. And if it's determined that there's not two or more eligible small businesses that are capable of doing the work at a fair and reasonable price, then if, if you can't make them fit with any of those four categories, then you say, okay, let's look at, you know, just small businesses in general. It doesn't matter if they have, you know, 8A or hub zone or woman owned or service sable bedroom zone. If at that point it's not determined there are at least two or more uh, capable, then it can be a full and open competition where any company, regardless of their size, can, can bid on it. Um, the last thing here is assistance agreements. I, I won't go into this too much, but assistance agreements are basically um, either grants or cooperative agreements. And those are typically for R&D, research and development. Um, you know, again, we could do a whole webinar on those, but but those are out there as well. So again, if your company does something that is more R and D focused, um, that might be something that um, you know may be of interest to you. 
Um, lastly, here on this slide, I, I referenced the Procurement Technical Assistance Center, otherwise known as PTAC. They're an invaluable resource to learn a lot about federal government contracting. And I'm going to talk about them later on in the presentation, but I purposely wanted to um, mention them up front because they're going to be a, a great resource for you if you decide to um, learn more about um, government contracting. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So we'll have to click uh, a little bit here. Um, I think we're good there. Yeah, thank you. So, so this is just depicting what I what I just discussed. So, you know, I, I think everybody learns differently, right? So, you know, we we talked about it. We had some words and a little, you know, I would say narrative of bullet points. But, but here's an actual pie chart with some colors. So, so this just breaks down the targeted set aside goals that we discussed. Um, so, for the 8A program and woman owned, it's um, they're each five percent. For the hub zone and the service disabled veteran zone, they're each um, 3%. So the, the, the first one there, the small disadvantaged business. Um, so what the government typically has accomplished or achieved is 10% versus five. And so they're exceeding the goal. So um, the Biden administration has actually just put out some uh, uh, policy initiatives saying they want to up that over time over a few years to 15% because they're saying that you know we've already got 10% that we're achieving so let's try and and get that up to 15%. Um, the woman owned small business program um, has typically been met recently but I think last year we just fell a little short. Uh, I'll mention where you can access that procurement scorecard so you can see some of this data um, later in the presentation. Hub zone is always a tough one to meet, um, and then service disabled veteran zone. You know, unfortunately, it's also a tough one to meet. You know, I know the government really does a lot to try and promote that program to support our veterans and 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 try and you know really give these um, contracting dollars to to the veteran organizations. But for whatever reason, that's that's one that's that's not always met. Um, just so you guys know too, there is also a veteran owned small business program not service disabled, just veteran owned, but um, consideration is given there for subcontracting opportunities. Um, however, if you do um, work with the Veterans Administration, the VA, they're required by law to um, uh, provide awards or at least consider awards first for both veteran owned and service disabled veteran owned. So I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you. I, I hope this is, you know, making sense. And again, we'll do Q and A at the end. But, 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 you know, I, I want to just be upfront with everyone. This is this is how it works. So if this is something you're really interested in, you you just have to, you know, have a baseline understanding of what the landscape is and, and do some some more research. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, the government's looking for the the best and brightest because they're taxpayer dollars and. You know, we look for contractors to provide uh, support services that um, federal employees cannot do themselves. So um, it really is a private uh, uh, public partnership. Um, and so it's just really important that we get the right kind of companies, you know, supporting us um, uh, across the enterprise. So as I mentioned, we're the world's largest buyer, uh, the federal government. And, um, you know, last fiscal year, we spent about $600 billion um, and about 23% of those federal contract dollars were intended for small businesses. I think we ended up spending, I want to say something about, you know, high 20s, I forget the exact number, maybe 28% um, of dollars that were set aside for small businesses. So, so as I mentioned before, um, and, you know, I apologize, these uh, one, two, three, I would flip these. This is a, a slide that our headquarters gave us. I should have uh, should have changed this, but it's okay. So, so we look at the small business set-asides first, um, and then we would do a full and open competition um, if we don't have at least two or, uh, or more small businesses that are qualified. The other option is if there's only one company out there that market research um, you know, indicates can do the work, we can do a sole source in the federal government. So that requires a, um, a justification um, for other than full and open competition. It's something that is frowned upon because we wanna have competition. But if we know at the end of the day, there's truly only one source that can do this work, um, that is another option the government has to be able to just do a direct award um, to, uh, to that one company. 
Um, the other way of doing direct awards are within those set aside programs. So um, again, it's not something the government prefers to do, but there is some uh, there are some authorities there where if you're a woman-owned small business or service-disabled veteran-owned or hub zone, you can get a sole source award. Um, the 8A awards, those are typically more sole sourced. That's the loan exception. And that's because that program is, is specifically dedicated to having a business grow and develop over a nine-year period of time. So the definition of a small business. So we're talking about small businesses. And, and so you're probably thinking, okay, well, how do I qualify? Do I qualify? What does it all mean? So, so the authorities, um, and I, I use that word a lot because that's where all this stuff comes from. Uh, you know, what are the authorities? What are the underlying regulations that um, dictate, you know, why we do, you know, what we do and how we do it? So, so the Code of Federal Regulations referred to the CFR, um, uh, provide the, um, the guidance really for, for how a lot of these programs work. Um, the federal acquisition regulations, they are, um, I guess I would say like the next step beneath the CFR. Um, so if you get a contract, uh, the agencies and, and, and the companies have to abide by those regulations as well. Um, key takeaway here is this NAICS code and size standards um, bullet point. So, the NAICS stands for North American Industry Classification System. Um, so it, it is what it means, North American. So it's the US, it's Canada, and it's Mexico. They collectively determine um, this industry classification system. It's a six digit uh, number that basically says, okay, um, you know, engineering services, administrative services. And, and these get like, you know, really in the weeds. Like there's a ton of these. And so if you're in the manufacturing industry, what SBA does is it will say, okay, you've got a manufacturing NAICS that these three countries have determined. How are we going to determine whether or not you're considered a small business? So for manufacturing, it's based on number of employees. So certain NAICS codes will have 500 employees as the cutoff. If you've got 500 employees or less, and your manufacturing uh, company, manufacturing NAICS code applies to you, then you're considered a small business. If it's greater, you're not a small business. Um, with regards to services-based industries, it's based on average annual revenue. And it used to be over a three-year period of time. Um, now it's changing to a five-year period of time. That's to help small businesses stay uh, 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 as a small business for the definition. So they, you know, there's some thought behind how all of this goes in, into play. So um, you know, some of them, it could be a you know, million dollars. Some of them, it could be 5 million. Some of them I've seen at 35. So you say to yourself, wow, a small business. I thought that was a mom and pop shop. Well, for the purposes of federal government contracting, it really depends. Um, Sometimes what happens is some small businesses will outgrow the size standard, but then they're kind of stuck in this limbo where they're not big enough to compete with, you know, the Boeings and the Raytheons of the world, say, if you're in, you know, in the defense contracting, um, but you're not small enough to get that, um, uh, that set aside or that preference anymore. So that's a known issue that that is being worked. But, but again, that's where the teaming arrangements of some contracts come into play where, you know, it, it's trying to think about different ways to get yourself business. Um, so in addition to meeting these NAICS codes requirements, your business also has to be a for-profit business of any legal structure, uh, be independently owned and operated, not be nationally dominant in its field, and be physically located and operate in the U.S. or its territories. Um, also says here that businesses outside the U.S. may still be counted as small if they have an operation in the U.S., that makes a significant contribution to the US economy through payment of taxes or use of American products, materials for labor. I typically don't like reading, you know, bullet points I have on there. I think it's the purpose, but I just wanted to, to just draw your attention to those things because you're probably thinking, well, what does that mean? And so again, this is all laid out in the Code of Federal Regulations in the CFR. Um, you can Google the CFR uh, at the end of the slide deck, I've got the link for it, but it's 13 CFR. That's the small business section of the CFR. 
And then I think it's like between sections 120 and 130, all the small business programs are, are laid out in there. So um, let's talk about how these opportunities can be identified and viewed. So with regards to federal agencies, um, what federal agencies do first and foremost is they post procurement forecasts. So before the actual contracting opportunity comes up, um, the agency is doing their acquisition planning. They are saying to themselves, okay, we've got a need. We need to develop our requirements. Um, let's do some market research. Let's see what small businesses are out there. Let's see what capabilities exist. Um, and that'll help inform us in terms of putting together our request for proposal and our solicitation. And so um, part of this is public law, as it's mentioned here. Um, and it's also to provide small businesses with advance notice of potential upcoming solicitations. And so um, on acquisition.gov, there's a section in there where you can view all the agency procurement forecasts. There's also another section where you can view um, uh, small business uh, liaisons and, and there's a directory in there. And now recently what they've done is the uh, uh, Office of Management and Budget um, in Washington DC has required each of the agencies to come up with uh, what are called vendor communication plans. So basically um, now agencies have to formally outline and, and, and post it to the public and make it transparent what their communication plans are to engage with industry. The whole point is to try and make this a more transparent process for the public and to try and engage the public to um, understand what capabilities are out there um, to best inform the acquisition planning for the, the federal agencies. And then the other uh, link here is SAM.gov. So SAM.gov stands for System, uh, System for Award Management. Um, if you're going to do any business with the government, you have to register yourself in SAM.gov. Um, that's what entity registration refers to. Um, all the contracting opportunities that are actually formal opportunities where they're live, they get posted on SAM.gov. Um, same thing with assistance listings if you're looking for grants or cooperative agreements. Um, and there's also some useful contract data there as well. So if you're trying to understand the marketplace, understand your competitors, you know, leverage the um, publicly available data that's there. You can go to SAM.gov. There's other websites too, and we'll get to that in a second, but you can go to SAM.gov and, and view some of that data. It's all public. So the key takeaway here, as I mentioned, is leverage all the available information and resources at your fingertips. I know it's a lot of information we're throwing out there, but, you know, we're trying to do our due diligence and just let you know that there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, so procurement technical assistance centers, otherwise referred to as PTACs, if you're interested in doing work with the government and you want to learn more, just sign up to be a client with the PTAC. Um, they are a tremendous resource. Um, they do exactly what you know the header says here. They provide technical assistance. So they help you determine if your business is truly ready to enter the federal um, contracting arena. They help you to register in the proper places like SAM.gov that I just mentioned. Um, they help you determine if you're eligible for certifications. Um, and the best part is it's a free service. Um, they'll even help you with putting together bids and proposals. I mean, they, they are just amazing. They are part of um, the DOD, the Department of Defense Network, but they also get funded by um, uh, the states as well. So they're funded by the Defense Logistics Agency within DOD and also by um, the state of Massachusetts. Um, there are different representatives across the state. Um, if you go to the website here, you'll be able to see them. We've got one who covers the Northeast, um, another who covers the Southeast, one who covers Western Mass, one who covers Central Mass, and they're trying to backfill a position for someone who covers uh, Boston. I mean, obviously now with webinars and doing things remotely, you know, they're not having one-on-one -on -one sessions, but they'll meet with the businesses, um, uh, you know, based on, on, on where the business is located. Um, typically, they do ask that you have two years of business experience, but again, they'll meet with anyone. So it's a free service. Definitely take advantage of it. Uh, that's, that's my biggest takeaway there. So some steps for success. So register as a PTAC client. Again, they're free services. 
if you, you know, are so inclined and, and you decide you really want to, you know, go, go for it and, and you want to, you know, engage in this, uh, in this world of government contracting, um, you want to register in the system for award management, otherwise referred to as SAM. Again, the PTAC can help you out with that. Um, you're going to have to think about how to develop a dynamic um, business capability statement. Again, that's something that the PTAC offers webinars on. Um, they can help you one-on-one. -on -one. It's basically a one-page document that, you know, some folks refer to it as a resume or a flyer, but you put the most pertinent information on there that you're going to give to um, either a government agency or um, a buyer in industry so that they can, you know, have something to take away and say, okay, yeah, I want to, you know, engage with this individual. I want to consider them and have them be part of my network. You know, the other way to do it is LinkedIn. Um, you know, so LinkedIn is really um, the electronic uh, method now of, you know, providing those hard copy or even e-copy capability statements. So as much as you can network, um, you know, that is um, super important. Um, I know it's mentioned somewhere else, but I'll mention it here too. Matchmakers, um, they used to have them in person. Now they're doing them virtually. It's just a way for you to connect with people. You never know who you're going to meet. Um, you know, I, I just can't say enough about that, just networking. Um, so that's truly important. You got to determine which NAIX codes you're eligible for. You can be eligible for more than one, but you just have to do your, your due diligence on that because the way the solicitations are issued is they're um, issued with a NAICS code. And so, you know, let's say they choose a specific NAICS code, um, you have to review it. If you think your company can do that work, you can just add the NAICS code yourself. It's, that's not a hard process, um, but you need to understand, you know, how that works in terms of, okay, I'm looking for an opportunity. I see that, you know, it's being offered under this NAICS code. Is that really something I can engage in? And if it is, okay, I need to know how to go into this SAM.gov system to be able to add that NAICS code. Um, researching these federal certifications and determining whether or not, you know, you're eligible. I mean, there's, you know, contact information too, if you go to SBA's website and, you know, there's people who can help you out too before you actually start to, um, go through the full application process, which can definitely take time. So some uh, continued steps for success. So researching the federal contracting marketplace. So as I mentioned earlier, you want to search those procurement forecasts. You want to search the open contract opportunities. There are various bid matching services that are offered. PTAC offers a service. SBA is working on offering one. There's other private ones as well. Um, you want to data mine existing contract awards to see what potential opportunities might be upcoming and also know who your competitors are. Um, and then you want to, as I mentioned, identify those competitors or you can view them as partners. So it could go both ways. You could say, you know what, hey, I really want to team up with this company. This may be in my best interests. Um, the other thing I want to mention here is a lot of stuff is free. There are things out there that you'll see where they're going to request money. And, you know, it's up to you if you want to pay for a service, I mean, you know, you can, that's your choice, but there are a lot of free services that federal government provides to, to its taxpayers. So really try and leverage those, those free services. And just because they're free doesn't mean they're not high quality. There's a lot of really high quality free services out there. Um, the last thing here is engaging in self-marketing activities. A lot of this is self-marketing. No one's going to come to you and say, hey, you know what, you're you know, a small business and you've got this certification, so I need to give you business or I need to give you a contract. It's not how it works. You, you need to be prepared to offer a solution, a value-added solution to a problem the government has um, and engage with the government as a partner. Um, and, and, that, and that's the way you're really going to be able to have a constructive conversation and determine whether or not, you know, a requirement the government puts out there is something you want to pursue. Um, so you can engage with the small business specialists and the federal agencies. Um, they're dedicated to advocating for small businesses. Again, if you go to that acquisition.gov website, they're all listed there. Um, I used to be a small business specialist before joining SBA. I was at U.S. Department of Transportation, so um, 
I'm, I'm telling you that that role is really a role that advocates for uh, the small business community. Um, as I mentioned, the matchmaker events, and then you want to consider state and local contracting opportunities as well. So um, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has an Office of Supplier and Diversity, um, and then also your local city and town business or economic development offices. You know, if, if you're interested in contracting, but you're, you know, not quite ready or you're a little apprehensive about going down the federal path, start at the, at the local level or at the state level. There's opportunities there. The different process, different certifications, different uh, ways to submit bids or proposals, but it's not as um, in-depth or intense as the federal space could be. Um, so just something to consider. So these are my tips for success. So we had steps for success before. These are my tips for success just based on my 13 plus years of, of federal service working in, in federal government contract. Um, as I mentioned, I was a small business specialist. I also was a contracting officer that did the buying. Um, and I was also on the program management side that came up with the requirements and engaged with the, um, with the companies, both small and large. Um, and, um, you know, and, and, and worked to uh, oversee these contracts and administer them. So, so I've been fortunate to have, you know, quite a bit of experience in, in this realm. So what I would say is you want to consider the time and financial commitments um, that are going to be required for you to perform, you know, the research needed to engage with folks in government and industry and to prepare your bids and proposals. So you have to just do a self-assessment on yourself and on your business. Are you really prepared at this point in time to, to engage in these activities? You know, what do you have going on? Does it make sense for you? Are you motivated to do it? I mean, that's something only you can decide on your own. So you really got to think about it. Um, and then um, you want to consider, is it worth it to be a prime or a sub or are there opportunities to do both? Um, you want to consider which organizations you want to work with. So, you know, in the federal government space, you want to do a little research and, and see which uh, government agencies are better to work with than others. They're not all created equal uh, and they're not all, they don't all operate equally. Some have, you know, bigger budgets than others. Some have more resources than others. Um, some have reputations, uh, good and bad. So same thing goes with engaging your, your private industry um, uh, counterparts as well. Um, you really want to make sure that you're establishing relationships that are worthwhile and you're not going to harm your reputation. Um, you want to research those agency missions and, and your partners or and or competitors, as, as I mentioned. Um, and again, this one is so important. You have to provide a value-added solution when you are self-marketing your company to others that is going to support the achievement of the agency mission and you want to be a problem solver. We're going to turn it over here to Caroline. She's going to talk about this slide and the next slide. Um, this is focusing on our resource partner network. This is also another both step and tip for success, leveraging these resource partners. Um, so Carolyn, take it away for me for the next couple of slides. Right. Yeah, thank you, Peter. And that was a lot of great information. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great, great, great. So. Peter, you've given us a lot of really awesome information, especially talking about the PTAC, but um, if you're a small business and you find yourself needing more assistance, maybe someone to sit down with you, walk you through the process, our resource partners can help with that. So if you go to our website, sba.gov MA, there's a tab for local assistance. So you put in your zip code and see which resource partners are near you so that you can get help. These resource partners can help you at any stage of your business, whether you're just starting out and need someone to look at your business plan or you're well into business, but perhaps need assistance with um, a social media plan and other things. They can also help you with loan applications for the different loan programs that we offer. Okay, so this is a more consolidated list of our main resource partners. And to reiterate, all of them can help you with your business. I'll just go briefly through each one because they kind of vary in their approach. So SCORE is a group of mentors who have either owned business in the past, owned businesses in the past, are current business owners, or have a lot of experience working with businesses large and small. They understand what it is to be a business owner and the ups and downs that come with it. So they are able to provide free counseling on a wide variety of topics. 
and the Massachusetts Small Business Development Center, much like SCORE provides free and confidential counseling for all sorts of things, whether it's your business plan, personnel, organizational issues, conventional and non-conventional funding, and of course, contracting. They are connected to the resources of the University of Massachusetts as well, so they have the backing of the university to help. At the Center for Women in Enterprise also provides confident, free and confidential counseling for many of the same sorts of things as SCORE and the Small Business Development Center, but this has a special focus on women and bus or women business owners. They are open to all. It's not just women. But they just do specialize in women owned businesses. If you want to get certified as a woman owned business, they can help you with that process, which as Peter talked about earlier, can help you in your quest to bid on federal contracts. At the Veterans Business Outreach Center, this is run by CWE as well. They have a focus on business training, counseling and resource uh, referrals to transitioning service members, veterans, National Guard and reserve members and military spouses who are interested in starting and growing a small business. And then at the Mass Export Center, if you are looking to take your business international, it might help you to conduct them. They can help you assess your readiness for international business, identify target markets overseas, help you with exporting logistics as like shipping and the documentation that you might need, NAFTA compliance, and I believe they offer translation services for marketing and promotional materials as well. And then lastly, the PTAC, which Peter has talked about, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but uh, the PTAC can help you assess your readiness for government contracts, help you with your SAM registration, identify opportunities, and then once you get going, they can help you bid, manage, and perform on your government contracts. And that will do it for me. Peter or Diane, do you want to add anything? Thanks, Caroline. That was great. I, I really appreciate that overview for the um, the resource partners. Um, Diane, I'm not sure um, if you wanted to just mention something about networking. I know we briefly talked about it, but you know that's um, uh, something that Diane has a lot of experience with the power of networking. So anything you want to add there, Diane, real quick? No, I think you guys have done such a good job. I think the most important thing to do is you know make a list of your fans and tell them what you need. Thank you, Diane. So the, the last slide here um, uh, talks about the COVID-19 Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, otherwise referred to as EIDL, E-I-D-L. So um, I, I threw this in there because as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, um, uh, with the pandemic still ongoing, with a lot of the other uh, pandemic relief and recovery uh, uh, support programs, funding programs, um, you know, either drying up in terms of funds or the authority has lapsed um, and they're no, no longer available. This one is still available um, through SBA. So right now we still have quite a bit of appropriations, quite a bit of dollars left. Um, uh, you can apply through the end of the calendar year at this point, unless the funds dry up sooner than that. Um, the loan threshold right now is 500,000 up to 500,000, excuse me. Um, for 24 months of economic injury. It's a 30 year fixed loan at 3.75%, no prepayment penalty or fees. Um, if you apply for an EIDL, you can apply for an increase if you wanna try and get up to that $500,000 figure. Um, and it's really meant to cover um, working capital uh, needs. Um, uh, and again, this is because of uh, businesses that have been impacted and have suffered economic injury during the uh, the pandemic. So I just wanted to throw this in there. This is the the, the really the the main program SBA currently has to provide funding to um, small businesses who are still in need of it. Okay, these are all the resource links that I uh, referenced or mentioned at some point during the presentation. I just wanted to to put them all neatly on one slide for everybody. Um, so we can go to the next slide. I, again, just to stay connected with us, uh, these are some SBA links and contacts. Um, we do encourage folks always to sign up for our e-newsletter. Um, we send a, a, a calendar of events at the beginning of each month, upcoming events, and then we send a, a formal newsletter mid-month. Uh, one went out today, actually, um, highlighting a lot of uh, different events that we have, different success stories, um, different you know guidance. There's a lot of information in there. 
Um, you can go to our website and view them as well, but if you sign up and, and get the updates, you'll just get them automatically. You'll be added to our Gov delivery um, listing. You can follow us on social media, on Twitter. You can email us directly. You can call us directly. And, um, you know, those are the uh, SBA's websites at the bottom. One is focused specifically on pandemic relief. One is the SBA uh, website and the other one is the Massachusetts website that we we have a dedicated page, you know, just for our office. So, so that is the conclusion of the SBA part of the presentation. Um, hopefully we have a little time for Q&A, but Amy, let me throw it back over to you for any, um, any other remarks. Thank you. Sure. Uh, well, did you want to address the Q&A first? Or I think one question came in in the Sure. Q okay. Can an ESOP obtain SBA loans? Now, to, to obtain an SBA back loan, I, I mean, I can share this. So to obtain an SBA back loan, um, you know, there are some stipulations there. So typically folks who get folks who get SBA back loans through our traditional loan programs, the 7A program, which is which is working capital, or the 504 program, which is more collateral fixed assets, typically you're unable to get traditional financing through your um, lending institutions. So th those are the typical SBA lending programs. Um, now, these other programs, you know, the COVID IDLE that I mentioned, or the, um, uh, I mean, the Paycheck Protection Program, you know, no longer exists, but those types of programs, there have been a lot of exceptions made um, where a lot of folks uh, qualify for these uh, loan programs, these funding programs, where traditionally they, they, they wouldn't qualify for our, our, our traditional programs. So, um, so I guess I'd just be curious too from, from the, um, the individual that asked, you know, is there a specific program they're looking for? Um, so again, if, if there's more of a specific question, you know, uh, please feel free to send it over to us and then we can research it some more. Okay, fantastic. I will put you in touch with the um, participant with the question. Well, great. thank you so much for providing so much great information today. Um, lots of good information about contract opportunities for small businesses. And I just want to let everyone know that MP also offers a full suite of products and services focused specifically on small businesses. We understand how much time it takes to run your business, and we help businesses across all industries streamline HR and payroll and keep you abreast of important um, compliance changes, making sure that, you know, pandemic and beyond that you're in compliance with your employee handbook and all your employee policies. Um, we've helped lots of businesses obtain pandemic assistance they needed to take a to stay afloat, including PPP loans and employer retention tax credits. Um, so if you have any questions, we have a dedicated team. Uh, Sam Petrie is one of our small business specialists. Please uh, reach out to Sam. His contact information is up here on the screen. And I will also be sending out the deck along with a recording um, of the program later in the day. So thank you again, Peter, Diane, and Caroline. Um, let us know if you have any further questions and have a great rest of your day, everyone. Okay, thanks very much, everybody. Appreciate the opportunity to present to you guys today. Take care. Absolutely, thank you so much.